Well, hi, Desert Church. We're glad you're joining us again. I'm Pastor Brian, and I'm joined by Pastor Kurt Thielen and Pastor Jody Livingston. And we're continuing in our series called Good News. And so kind of the anchor verse for this series is in chapter 1 of Romans, and it's verse 16. And I want to read it just to remind us, and then we're going to dive into what we have for you today. But it says, for I am not ashamed. This is Paul speaking. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We talked about that last week. Gospel meaning good news. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And so we see in this verse the introduction of he's not ashamed and he's saying some things about the gospel. And the thing that he, I want to highlight this week, guys, is power. And so when you think of the power of the gospel, you know, Jody, what, what comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that pops into my mind is, is probably not something that I would normally associate with power, but specifically as it relates to the gospel, I think of the patience of God. Because I think of, uh, you, you, we see Paul write to Timothy, you know, and, and, and think, man, it was for the patience of God to be displayed that, that he waited to save Paul when he did. And I think we all have people in our life, probably, that we would, man, wonder, does uh, is, can they be saved? Does God have a plan to save them? And do we still have hope that they can be saved? And so and I think through, man, this idea and the reality that the power of the gospel, the power of the good news ha- has the power to, to save and exhibit patience, even as we kind of run in our rebellion. Man, that, 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 that just settles so deep with me and so strongly, um, even though it's probably not what we would normally think in terms of power. Right, right. Patience. But patience, I mean, it's such an important aspect of even thinking through the, the biblical narrative, right? The, the mm. overarching story. Yeah. It took a long time. I mean, yeah. this, this isn't a fast process from what we talked about last week in, in uh, this promise coming, and yet it took a long time getting there. And so, I mean, Kurt, what do you think of when you think of the power of the gospel? Yeah, even in that verse, I love the concept there. All those things are happening. It says it's to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And I think the power of the gospel is so amazing because it overcomes the tribes, the, the, the culture, the opinions, right. all of the uniquenesses that we have. And no matter where we're coming from, the power of the gospel overwhelms that. And it's able to take us in our uniquenesses and pull us together and unite us to a common cause right. Right. where the kingdom becomes the thing that ties us together. Yeah. The purposes and plan of God are what pulls us to be family. And I just think... It's a supernatural power that the gospel could take so many different people from all across our planet and all put us into this spirit of following after Jesus Christ. I just love that. Yeah, no, for sure. And yeah, and the, the power of, of the kingdom that continues to push and, and unites us. And we all, we, we all know we desperately need uniting right now, yeah. I think, yeah. in our country, in our culture, everything. So, well, we're going to continue in the series, and we're going to be talking more about the believe part today, what we believe about the good news. And so if you remember last week, we dropped off um, talking about the bad news of the good news, the fact that sin is in the world, it created separation, and it also caused um, man and woman to be kicked out of the garden, this place where God set them to have us community with him. And now they're set outside and they're having to toil on their own. And Pastor Jason read these verses where it, it just before that, there's something very important that often gets skipped over. And it's right at the end of chapter three, where it says that God provided animal skins to cover the nakedness of the people. And um, that's an important part of the, the biblical narrative, the providing of, of something to cover and cover over you know, nakedness, which is kind of what came about because of sin. And so we're going we're gonna to see this, you know, reality flesh itself out in Scripture. And the, the title of today's is A Love That Surprises, today's message, The Love That Surprises. And one of the, the surprising things that, that might, you know, be very surprising to us is what I want you to fill in for, for number one, and it's this. It's surprising that salvation requires a sacrifice. It's, it's surprising to us that salvation requires a sacrifice. Now, um, it might be very surprising to us because we're not used to sacrifice as far as animals and things like that. You know, um, the pet industry is a $99 billion industry. You know, the Haney's now have two geckos living in our home and it's great, right? You got nothing else to do. So you watch, you know, you know, you watch lizards eat bugs. And so we've got this in the pet industry, but 
In the biblical narrative, um, this comes through over and over again. And not only in the illusion right there where God provided animal skins to cover the people, but immediately in the next chapter of the Bible, we're going to see this reality that sacrifice um, is something that helps the communion, a community between God and man continue because sin has created separation. Sacrifice somehow provides a gap bridge. And so in chapter four of Genesis, immediately after, we see the story of Cain and Abel, the two first people born of Adam and Eve. Cain worked the fields and Abel worked the flocks. They both bring an offering to the Lord. Abel brings the fat portion of his flock, brings it to the Lord, the Lord accepts it. Cain brings um, the fat portion of his vine and the Lord doesn't accept it. And so we read in chapter uh, four of Genesis, verse six, it says, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face downcast? Why are you frustrated? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door and its desires to have you, but you must rule over it. There's a lot in that verse, but what I want you to get is the fact that God actually said, look, what you've provided isn't right. There is something that is right. And if you do what's right, you'll be accepted. And he accepted the offering that Abel brought, which was an animal. And so we see this come up over and over again, where this blood uh, sacrifice is required by God. And that is strange to us, but it's so important. And it brings up this biblical idea called atonement. Now, this isn't the doctrine of atonement. This is a definition of what the word atonement means. And I want you to write this down as well. Atonement is a payment made to provide justice for the offenses of sin. A payment made to provide justice. See, sin requires that justice be served. It's not just that it can be um, skated over, looked over. No, it has, to, it, actually, it has to be covered over by something. And in the biblical narrative, what we see is the thing that is required is a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, a death. And that makes us uncomfortable a little bit because... Um, we just don't like the idea. And, and what is this, you know, is God requiring this? Well, what we're going to see even today is that God doesn't require something that he's not willing to give. Mm, yeah. God doesn't require yeah. something he's not willing to give. It's so, and, and so when we look at the pages, I want you to keep that in mind. Though that may be a strange concept to us, it's an important theological reality to us. We see this come up again in the story of Abraham and Isaac, where um, Abraham is called by God and he's gonna do a special work through him. He tells him, I'm, I've got a son for you and out of, your son, out of your loins, you and Sarah will be a vast number of people. They're really old, they have the son, they're excited about it. And then God tells him to take his son and to take him to a certain mountain and then to sacrifice him to God. <laughs> Most of us would be like, no, what? That's weird. That doesn't that's make awesome. any sense. That, yeah. That's hard. That's a, that's a hard test. But Abraham, he gets up in the morning and, and we see from scripture that there's no hesitation. He gets up and he starts on the journey. And so we pick it up in verse nine of chapter 22 of Genesis, where he says, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand. He took a knife to slay his son. Don't miss the reality of the weight of this moment. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. He says, here I am. He, you know, you could just see <laughs> yeah, him almost yeah. like with a smile. Yeah. yeah, what do you want now? All right, you're going to tell me something new. And the angel said, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. So Abraham looked up and there in the thicket was a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and he took the ram, he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And he called that place the Lord will provide. And on that day, you know, and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. And so we see where God calls for a sacrifice, but then he provides a sacrifice. We see the same thing happen again in Exodus. If we keep just trudging through the story of Scripture, in Exodus, the Passover lamb, Exodus story is all about God calling his people out of bondage in Egypt, 
Pharaoh refusing to let them go. Nine plagues happened that showed and displayed the power, the authority of God over creation and over all things. And then there's this 10th plague, which is the plague of the death of the firstborn, where God told the Egyptians, look, if you don't listen, Pharaoh, then I will take your firstborn. Your firstborn of all the people of Egypt will die. But he says to Israel, listen, take a lamb, bring it into your home, let it dwell with you. Then I want you to sacrifice the lamb. I want you to collect some of the blood in a bowl. I want you to take some hyssop branches as a paintbrush and spread it over the doorposts of your homes. And then I want you to consume the rest of it, leave nothing till morning and be ready because this is going to be what sets you free out of bondage. And so in, in chapter 23 of Exodus 12, it says this, when the Lord goes through the land, to strike down the Egyptians. Judgment had to come. He will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. Pass over as in stick himself in front of, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. So we see right here where God says, look, this lamb is now going to become a substitute for the firstborn. And he gave instruction to his people But just like Cain, they had to follow it. And those that followed it escaped the judgment of God. And so we see this substitutionary reality of death has to come. The only thing that can fix the the fact that death has entered the world through sin is a death itself. And so, Jody, why don't you you just pick up from there and and continue the good news story? (laughs) Right, 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 because that doesn't sound good. Sounds sounds horrible. Well, and I think you're. I think what's so beautiful again, even going back to our opening statements about the patience and the power to save and to reconcile, and this plan that God um, put in in place is that that it really sets the stage and the theme for what He would ultimately do for us through through Christ. And so, when we get all of a sudden then to the New Testament, we we see that ultimately this this Lamb of God, this Passover Lamb, is is fulfilled in the person of Jesus, right? In, in John chapter 1, 35 and, and 36, we see John the Baptist uh, there, uh, Duncan folks. He looks up, he sees Jesus uh, come in, and, and he cries out and says, look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away sin. Uh, and, and, and so we see John recognize and say this initially. Then we even get further. We can go into uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 5, 7. The apostle Paul writes here even more about Jesus in it. He says that, that Christ is our Passover lamb and he, he has been sacrificed. And so I think this, this surprising nature that, that sacrifice would be required for salvation is, is jarring to us. But, but, but even, even beyond that is this idea that, man, that Jesus is that sacrificial, sacrificial lamb. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, Paul writes kind of about this this idea, and he says this beginning in verse 18. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. For where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God... Uh, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And I think about that, uh, that the, uh, this idea that, that, that God would send his own son for us, that he would pursue us in that. Like, that is, su- that is surprising, <laughs> that, that, that we, have, we have committed these sins against him that have, that have separated us, like we, we talked about last week, and yet the answer for that sacrifice wasn't for us to have to do something else. But ultimately, like, all of our doing, all of our good works, all of our things fall short of that. that. That ultimately, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so I think, you know, we get to the second blank here in our notes. I would say that it's surprising that the sacrifice 
is the Savior. That the sacrifice that was required ultimately ends up being the Savior himself. That, that we see him come in pursuit of us to save us from our sin, even in our sin. He didn't require us or ask us to go clean ourselves up and then come when we were ready. But in our lostness, in our sin, in our depravity, in all of our mess, in all of our hope, hurts, and lack of, lack of hope and, and struggle and strife, he saw us and pursued us uh, in that. And, and as Paul says here, like, that sounds so foolish, right? That, that, that you would take someone who is actively really living in rebellion against you, an enemy, so to speak, and that you would give your life for that person so that you could reconcile them back to you. And, and I think about this even as it compares to other religions, um, and, and, you know, you think of, of other pagan religions or other, other religions, they all require something of you. Like they demand that you, you do something in order to gain favor, reconciliation with him. And that is, that is not what we find in the scriptures, but the exact opposite is true, that he did something for you. That he did for you and I what we could not do for ourselves. And maybe I'll explain it this way. This would be good. When I grew up on the East Coast in, in the mountains up there of Tennessee. And I remember when we, when we moved out here, you, know, you can't go anywhere in this high desert without seeing mountains. Um, and where I grew up, there were a lot of trees everywhere. So the mountains were there, but you didn't quite see them until you got to them. But here, they're, they're, man, they're everywhere. You drive down the pass to go, to go down the hill and you see, see these mountains. And so I think a lot of people would describe all religions the same in, in the sense that we are all standing around the bottom of this mountain trying to figure out how to get to God who's on top. And we can all pick a different path, but ultimately maybe we're all ending up at the top. We're all ending up there with God. And yet what scripture would teach us is the exact opposite. That the thing that sets us apart, the thing that sets the scriptures apart, and the Savior and the salvation that we have is that God left the top of the mountain and came down to us to find us so that then we can be reconciled with him at the top. And listen, don't miss this. That is, that is very, very distinct. <laughs> That's not you being a better person. That's not you doing more. That's not you going to church more often. That's not you reading your Bible more. Listen, it's good to read your Bible more. It's good to go to church and attend church more often. But those things happen as an overflow of what God has done in his pursuit of us and his, his saving of us. And so what this means then is two things. And these are some fill-ins there for you. It means this, that Jesus then is our substitution. The substitution that you talk about, that, that, that he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. The atonement that was required, the payment that was needed for our sin he paid, he became that substitution for us, that Jesus was our substitution. And the second is this, that Jesus then, because he is our substitution, is our only hope for salvation. Like there is no other, there is no other hope. He is the one who paid the price, no one else. So there is no other way to get to him. We can't go around it because the substitution, the sacrifice is what is required. And so all of a sudden now, the, the exclusivity of Christ isn't something that, is, that, is, that should be seen as like a negative, like, oh, well, you're saying only your way is right. No, no, no. We're saying that God loved you so much that he found the only way he could to allow you into that. And that means that he's our substitution and, and our salvation. And I think this, this to me feels so surprising and to so many, like the Apostle Paul would say, just seems and feels like absolute foolishness. Why would God do that? Why would he do that? Why would he? I mean, we talk about the anguish of Abraham being asked to sacrifice his son, and yet we watch this happen and play out in the person in work of Jesus. And yet all of this, what we would consider foolishness, is so consistent with the character, the pursuit, and the demonstration of God's love for us and for his people Man, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, it, and it's heartbreaking to me to, to think how easily we dismiss the sacrifice that God has paid. I mean, I'm a parent. I mean, giving my son for someone who doesn't even like me. Listen, we live in a cancel culture right now. If you don't agree with me, 
You can unfollow me. That's what we say, right? If I'm blocking you, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't need to talk to you right now. And, and we talk about the value of, 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 of what Christ has seen in those that he sought to pursue. And he did it out of love. And he gave, I mean, what more could he give? What more could he give to demonstrate his love and to, to, to win you to himself? And, and the value that we place on life and a life given and a sacrifice shed. Oh man, I, I just think that is, that's a weight that we often dismiss. And to many, like, like Paul says, foolishness. But to us, this is life-saving hope and truth. Right, and power. And right? power. And, power. power. and, yeah. and even the, the fact, like you talk about, you know, it's surprising, this you know, we talk about sanctity of life, right? Yeah. Even on this weekend, this idea that God, you know, considers all life important, valuable, and not worth taking, except he provides himself, mm. you know? And, and that is a surprising love, <laughs> the surprising love that he would step into that. And we, we know the rest of the story, right? We can't forget that resurrection piece because it's not that he left him, right? Because he didn't do wrong and that's how he, he covers over us. But that surprising love is just a, it's an amazing thing to think of when we consider how valuable God considers all human beings that are made in his image. And so Kurt, why don't you pick up from there? Yeah. I love that thought, just how God reflects his love, and he just loves demonstrating it. We know that. He demonstrated while we are still sinners, and I think that's just amazing. And you know, I'm looking through the Bible and how often we see stories of God saving people, God protecting people, God caring for people. God always seems to be intervening on behalf of the people that he, he looks out for, and it's just amazing. Even today, we talked about you know, Isaac. God had spared Isaac in that moment. God spared the Israelites out of Egypt. And you look at his, his, what he does in that, and, and he just goes out of his way to save us. He does that, and, but at the same time, which is so surprising, he refuses to save himself. And that is surprising. And this is in your notes if you want to write that down. It's surprising that the Savior saved others, but not himself. You know, it's, even if you think about that, when Jesus was dying on the cross, the religious spiritual leaders of the day uttered those exact same words. They said he saved others, but he can't save himself. It was just surprising to everyone around him because everywhere Jesus went when he walked on earth, he intervened on behalf of others. But in the very moment when everyone thought and expected him to come down from the cross, he stayed there. He just stayed on the cross because he had a different plan. And it wasn't that he couldn't save us, save himself. He could have saved himself. He could have come down and totally non got through, not, not have gone through that experience. But he did, and he sacrificed himself, and he became a substitute for us. And, and you look at that substitution, why it was so important. Jody, you kind of mentioned this. It's, it's that he became the substitute to deal with the devastation of our sin that we could never pay, and also to meet the perfect holy requirements of a perfect God. And in that moment, he was the only person that could do that. He alone could save us. No one else could do that. And yet, it still required him to hang on the cross and not save himself. Someone once said, and I like this quote, he said, The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. We always want to take God's spot and God graciously says, I'll take yours. And the choice that he, when he made that choice, I find it interesting that it really created an avalanche of good gifts that he poured our direction. Romans 8.32 says this, If God is for us, who can be against us? It's a great question. If God is for us, who can be against us? And then he goes on to say, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will, he, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? By not sparing Jesus from the cross, God has given us gifts. And the first one in your notes is that he's, his sacrifice provided access to forgiveness. That's that blank in your notes. When he sacrificed himself, he provided forgiveness for us. 
2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 19 say this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. I love that last line there. He was reconciling us, not counting our sins against us. Uh, the sacrifice of Christ didn't appease an angry God. It, re it repaired a fractured relationship. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I get in the doghouse. Sometimes I do things wrong. Sometimes I offend people. Sometimes I break relationship. And when that happens, if you're like me, and you probably are, you're, it's tough living in a house with that tension of a broken relationship. It's hard to find joy when you're trying to act like there isn't a problem, but everyone knows there is. And it's just downright uncomfortable. And, and I, there's those times in life where I think in those moments, the weight of that just begins to pound me, where you just feel the burden of something has to change because I don't want to stay in this environment. And I think it's the same way in our relationship to God. Uh, Jesus died so that you and I could find forgiveness and reconcile our relationship to him. And he died so that we might actually enjoy his presence. Um, imagine being forever in heaven with God and not actually being forgiven. That would be miserable, knowing that you're bearing a weight. And, and God says, that's not what I'm going to do. He loves us so much that he stayed on the cross so that he could provide forgiveness so that we could have peace with God. When you work through that relationship in your home and things are now right, that peace that settles in, when you finally realize we're in a good place, it's just so relaxing and you feel at ease and comfortable again in the presence of those of the family members maybe that you've hurt. How much more so when we get to heaven and live in that moment with God and even now as he's given us forgiveness in this life. Uh, there's so much that God has given us but for me, the most important thing is our forgiveness of our sins because it re repairs that fractured relationship. I'm so grateful that he went through the agony to make that a reality. 2 Corinthians 5.21, if you're still in that passage in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul goes on and he says, he says, God made him who knew had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's the second thing I'm going to have you note there in your notes. His sacrifice provided access to righteousness. How crazy is it, guys, that we get the benefit of Christ's death and he bears the weight of our sin. Jesus took the record of my sinful life and your sinful life and he says, I'm going to take that record and own it myself and then I'm going to give you the record of my holy, perfect existence. We don't have to pay the price for our sins, we're forgiven, which is awesome. But then that verse there says that we have been credited with this righteousness. The good and gracious works of God are put onto our account. So not only we not have things held against us, but we're now blessed by the goodness and gracious work of God. And it just kind of, like you were saying, Jody, it, it goes against religion that we see around us. Everywhere in our world today, we see this idea of a performance-based relationship to God. We say, basically, if I obey, therefore God will accept me. And the cross of Jesus Christ actually refutes that entire idea. At the cross, we can actually go up and say, I'm accepted by God through Christ. Therefore, because of that acceptance, I'll choose to obey. When Jesus gave himself up for you and I, he just destroyed that illusion that we could earn our way there. His goodness, His righteousness, His holiness have all been gifted to those of us who believe and trust in Him. And that's the kind of forgiveness and the righteousness that we need. And we look at those two things and they're actually linked into these two beautiful attributes of God, the mercy and the grace of God. By His mercy, He forgives us. By His mercy, He says, I'm not going to hold that against you. And then by His grace, He gives us what we don't deserve the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that perfection where thou and we can stand before God at peace with him, having a great confidence that we can know and love the Savior and live our life with him, follow him with joy, 
and to become everything that God has intended us to be. We've been forgiven. We are now righteous because of the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ where he took our place on the cross so that we could have life. And that life was secured through his resurrection, through this new life that he provided by defeating death, both on the cross and then ultimately through this raised life. And I just love the fact, guys, that we can live with him now. We can have the power both to be forgiven, to have that peace with God, to have the righteousness of Christ, that we don't have to live in our old lifestyle. And we know that we'll live forever with him in that place because he beat death by rising from the dead. Yeah. Absolutely. And even thinking through, like you guys both alluded to it, this, and I love that piece about the righteous, we're given the righteousness of God, not just given the righteousness like, oh, you look righteous now, but no, given the ability to be righteous, to act righteous, to have an appropriate perspective on the world around you, on the people around you. And even as we, you know, celebrate, you know, on Monday, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s day, remembering the civil rights movement, remembering the reconciliation of people to people that was inappropriate and demeaned the image of God as it was it was based on race. And, and all of those things that have took place and we celebrate um, how the image of God was recaptured in our civil law. But you notice, right, it didn't change people's hearts. <laughs> well, and I love that quote. I don't remember the details, but uh, Martin Luther King Jr. made that quote about our willingness to forgive relates to our ability to love. And that is so true right. that if we are unwilling to forgive ourselves, if to live that kind of life, it really reflects on our inability to love well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, in that we see so important when God forgives us then he opens up a way for us to love him in return and love others as he created us to, right? Created us to. Yeah. Yeah, I think you th even yeah, my, the thing that comes to mind when you say that is like love is the currency of forgiveness, right? In, in the sense that it always costs the one forgiving, not usually the one who is, is, is forgiven. And that certainly plays out with what we see in, in the scriptures. And, and uh, man, just what I, I think Colossians... Colossians talks of Paul writes to the church Colossians says, man that he might present you blameless holy and blameless and above reproach before him and that is totally because of what Christ has done uh, on our behalf as he brings us together into this one body from very different backgrounds very different hurts brokenness all because of his 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 substitutionary sacrifice on our behalf Right. That's powerful, man. Yeah, and that's the power of the gospel. And the power of the gospel is that we believe this. We believe that he accomplished what we were unable to. And we also believe that he offered it to us. And so I, I encourage you, if you're a believer a long time, ponder these things. Think about these things. Think about how to communicate them with your oikos, with the world around you. Because without this message, as Jody even highlighted, he is the only source <laughs> Of, of forgiveness. He's the only substitute that is available to us, and, and they need to hear that message. But if you're here today and you haven't heard that message, Pastor Kurt, why don't you just share with them what do they do? I mean, how do they reconcile themselves to the Lord? Yeah, that's the, that's the big issue really is becoming right with God and having a healed relationship with the God of the universe. And even if you were with us last week, we talked about admitting that you have to admit that you can't save yourself. And for most of us, we know that's pretty self-evident. We've broken our relationship to God through our behavior, through our actions, and through our attitudes. And so there has been a separation. There's been a shattered relationship. It's believing that Jesus Christ has done everything we've talked about today, that Jesus Christ has fulfilled everything that we need to have a relationship with God, that by believing in him, that your sin will be placed onto him and his righteousness will be given to you, making you blameless and building that relationship back up with God. And ultimately, it just requires you to choose, to make that choice, to say, today in this moment, God, I accept what you have done for me. I admit that I can't save myself and that I've sinned, I've wronged you. And I believe that Jesus paid for those wrongs. And as I give my life to Jesus right now, that we could start in a fresh relationship where I could be your child again. And that image of God that you've made me in can be restored to what you want it to be. Uh, if that's what you want to do, I'd invite you just to close your eyes right where you're at and we'll pray. And you can just say something simple like this, Father, I do admit 
my sin. I admit that I have broken my promises to others, to you, that I've acted in my own way that isn't pleasing. God, I believe that Jesus Christ came, he lived a perfect life, and he died a death to take my place, that he became my substitute so that I could have life in exchange for his death. And today I choose, God, to give you my life, that you have purchased my life on the cross, and I give it to you now as a gift back to you, that you could use me to become everything you want me to be in you, and now I offer you my full allegiance. If you prayed that in your heart right now, the Bible says that you are indeed a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And Father God, as we go out this week, I pray, God, that we would live in the reality of what your death has accomplished for us. That we don't have to hold our head down, but God, we could be confident that we are blameless in your eyes. I pray, God, that we would live out that holiness every day, empowered by your Spirit, and that we would seek to be reconcilers of others, to reach into our world, our 8 to 15, the people on the front row of our life, to let them know how much your life, your death, your resurrection has changed who we are. God, may many people hear the story of the good news and give their hearts to you. We pray this all in the name of our loving, amazing Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys for, for sharing with us, and we appreciate it. And y'all at home, I hope you just have a great week, that you think about these things and see how they can translate into your everyday life. We'll see you next time.